when he joined the staff of Toronto's Tom Taylor Company, following in the footsteps of his late uncle, Con Costas. Gord has a long-held respect for steamship, for seamanship, I beg your pardon, and an appreciation for traditional rigging. He began importing gear for sail training and museum ships in 1999 when he was captain of the HMSB. And for some of you, you will remember we visited that ship on one of our uh, excursions in June. And it is a reproduction gunboat schooner operated by the government of Ontario on the upper Great Lakes. He began distributing rope and rigging across North America on a full-time basis in 2003, after returning from 18 months as a lead technical advisor to the pr production team of the feature film Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. He has served as an historical advisor to over 60 film and television productions, recently working with Tom Hanks on the production of the World War II drama Greyhound. Gord was co-founder of the Atlantic Challenge Canada, uh, served as an executive director of Toronto Brigantine, and has sat on the board of Huronia Museum and the Midland Public Library. Even though as a professional mariner, he dislikes shipwrecks, he also sits on the board of the Great Lake Shipwreck Historical Society. Gordon is a frequent public speaker on issues involving seamanship, nautical history, and youth development. He served 11 years an officer in the Royal Canadian Navy and was at the time of his commissioning, the oldest person to complete the RCN's tough basic officers training course. Core to his operations in his company, GH Laco and Son Limited, which specializes in traditional gear for ships and yachts. He is proud of that his son Robert has joined him in the business. And he tells us this morning may soon be taking over. When he has time, he races and cruises on the waters of Georgian Bay. And if the son does take over, he'll have more time to do that. This is the fourth time Gord has spoken to Shellbacks, but it has been, um, well, not 10 years because he joined us much more recently to speak to us. So please give Gord a warm Shellback welcome. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everybody. Um, it's uh, nice to be here. And I'm thinking with the uh, advent of the pandemic, how familiar speaking by Zoom has become. Just three years ago, just before the pandemic, the uh, Jane Austen Society in Kansas City invited me to do a talk on uh, Jane Austen's brothers who served in the Royal Navy. And because at that time I was just starting working on the Hanks film and my U.S. work permit was very specific about what I was allowed to do in the U.S., I feared crossing the border uh, at the airport and having some customs man Google my name and find out that I was a fe featured speaker at the Jane Austen Society. And yes, they had paid me my ticket, which to the Americans constitutes gainful employment, which I did not have a permit for. So I hit upon the idea of uh, FedExing my presentation to them by uh, uh, on a computer chip and then phoning in my talk while a guy in the hall hit advance every time I said advance, please as the pictures rolled by. Normally when I talk to people, I watch the audience and if I see interest in people's faces, I stay on a topic longer. If I see people starting to do this, I, I move on. But on this occasion, of course, I couldn't see anybody. It was just me sitting in this little office in Midland, Ontario and 1200 people in the theater in Kansas City. I couldn't see or hear them. And I'd never done such a thing before. I have people who work in radio, of course, are used to it, but not me. So I, I figured what I needed to do was reach out to them somehow to establish some kind of personal contact. So I worked a joke into my first picture. After the uh, nice introduction, uh, and thank you, Diane, for yours, uh, I put a picture up and I said, to thank you for being uh, allowing me to be here as a disembodied voice. I thought we'd start off by showing you what I look like. And I put a picture of Ad Admiral Lord Cochrane up on the screen. So on my screen, it was just on my computer, but in the hall, it was on the theater screen. And Cochrane lived long enough to be uh, photographed. He's the man Patrick O'Brien based Jack Aubrey on in those novels. 
And he was a crusty old fellow with about 40 pounds of medals on his chest. And he clearly looked like he didn't like the idea of posing for this newfangled photograph in the 1850s. And I waited for the audience to laugh. And of course, I couldn't see or hear them. And I froze. <laughs> And there was a long silence. And then thank God the young man in the theater who was operating the PowerPoint machine realized why I'd frozen. And I heard my, my cell phone buzz and I uh, looked at it and it, it, he sent me a line in capital letters, they are laughing a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> that gave me the courage to continue. So uh, well, how the world has changed since then. Uh, I've done one talk in person, uh, actually at RCMI a few weeks ago, but uh, this has become normal. And what a, what a strange thing that is. Um, and I'm also reminded uh, that I, the first time I stood up and sang a sea shanty at Shellback was in 1982. Doesn't that seem like another century? I was working at Tom Taylor Company then, and uh, one of my clients who had, had become a friend was a Shellback, and he said, Gord, you should come. So that started me on an uh, hour and a half or two hour lunches every Wednesday in the winter, which thank goodness uh, Tom Taylor Company's owners indulged me in. But that was when I, I first began uh, appearing there. Um, as Diane mentioned, I'm just back from my first uh, traveling business trip since, since the pandemic. Uh, my son and I uh, drove to Nova Scotia and did a tour of boat building shops, chandleries and ships that we supply. Uh, I tell people that if what they're looking for is heavy and obsolete, that's our thing. We sell real bronze uh, deck hardware, real wooden shelled blocks, everything brand new, five kinds of synthetic rope that looks like hemp, including hemp, basically everything for classic yachts and sailing ships you can imagine. Even We even have artillery pieces fabricated by the, the Krups of, uh, of Simcoe County, as I call them, uh, who normally make uh, high pressure steam fittings for the nuclear industry but uh, indulge me in turning gun barrels for me when I need that for historic ships. I'm very pleased to report that the marine industry on the East Coast is booming as it is here in Ontario. Uh, the boat builders are all going at capacity. Uh, some of them are booked two years in advance for spaces. Uh, there's a lot of new construction of wooden yachts going on, probably more than I've ever seen in my career, uh, which stretches back to the mid 70s. And uh, the people are happy and busy. Uh, the stress is getting good. Uh, what people talk about in the news with regards to supply chain problems is real. Uh, my big issue in my own business is getting things. Most of my uh, goods come from Holland, Norway, Germany, and England, and uh, shipping across the Atlantic has uh, probably gone up 200% in cost, uh, and uh, that's that's hurt things a little bit. But it's uh, I, uh, you just have to furrow your brow, put your shoulder down and go. Uh, when I was in the Royal Canadian Navy, we used to tell each other, the hard and the easy, we take as it comes. And that, I think, is a an expression that uh, works in business as well as elsewhere. So um, getting to the topic of today's talk, uh, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll run through the description and the story I'm going to tell. But I always find the most interesting thing is the Q&A session afterwards. And I'm really looking forward to that because I love to talk to a group of sailors because I, I don't have to explain the basics. You folks probably already know what I'm talking about as I get to things. And I expect hard questions from you. So uh, sharpen your pencils uh, as I go. And uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to answer your queries at the end. So we moved here to Midland in 1989. Uh, in the early 90s, I, I joined uh, what was then called uh, uh, the Historic Naval Establishments over in Penetanguishing. And I discovered uh, Lieutenant Henry Bayfield. He is a man who, if we were all Americans, would be on cereal box covers. But we don't make enough of our heroes here in Canada. So maybe I'm on a bit of a campaign to change that in his case and, and some others. He was born in the late 1700s in England. At age 11, he, he was sent to a ship in the Royal Navy. And his first action that he fought was literally six hours after he stepped aboard that ship. He survived the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, I'll get into that a little bit in the talk when we show our pictures. In fact, maybe I should start the slideshow. Pardon me and indulge me, please, while I do just a brief fumble getting that up. And here it comes. I'll put this on 
slideshow. And here we go. Yep, it's up. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, that's Bayfield. Uh, he lived to be an admiral, and I'm afraid Diana made a typographical error when I was describing uh, the age that he, uh, year that he passed away. He actually lived to be 90 years old and passed away in 1885 in Charlottetown. I got mm. that correct. Uh, he did die an admiral. Uh, in, when this photograph was taken uh, in the 1850s, he was a commander. Those of you in the service, David Mulholland, uh, will see he's, he's got his three stripes that we still use to denote that rank. He survived uh, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, having fought in several actions, quite savage actions, was wounded severely in the head as a teenager in a fight off Gibraltar. And when the war came to an end, he was on the, on the Great Lakes. I describe that period to people sometimes uh, as uh, the end of what was a three generation long world war. It's hard for people today to imagine that we have had cataclysms in the last century here that marked and scarred our, our families. Imagine that going on almost continuously for three generations and finally it ended. The Great Lakes uh, were well known, of course. The French had been exploring the area uh, from the 1600s on. And of course, the First Nations people had been here for tens of thousands of years before that. And incidentally, at this point, I'll interject something that occurred to me while I was listening to the very moving uh, 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 grace that was said at the beginning of, of our meet here. I was uh, present uh, having brought HMCS Oriole, who I look after on a, uh, on a contract with the, um, with the Royal Canadian Navy to Hamilton for the recommissioning of my beloved Pathfinder, who uh, went through another massive refit this past couple of years. The last time she received such attention was when I was the executive director back in the 90s. It was so good to see her coming out as a new vessel again. A First Nations elder gave the benediction at the beginning of the ceremony. It was raining and it stopped raining while he was speaking. And with enormous good humor, he paused in his speech, looked upwards and mumbled in a stage whis whisper, wow, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> and then carried on with the event. So <laughs> the lakes were well known to Europeans as well as First Nations people. Uh, the, the, the basin of the Great Lakes were the seat of the War of 1812, which despite what some popular history in the Southern US might have you believe, was actually about a renewed attempt by the young USA to, as Thomas Jefferson put it, take Canada and complete the work of the revolution. Well, we all know they failed, and it was in no small part due to the First Nations and uh, uh, the settlers who'd come and a very small group of professional soldiers and sailors who defended our country. Because the war was a near-run thing, the Royal Navy decided it needed to do everything it could to... Uh, uh, to prepare itself for a renewed offensive, which every indication appeared might happen. Charts and maps existed of the Great Lakes for a long time, but they weren't very accurate because no uh, professional survey of the lakes had happened as we would know it today. This is a French uh, drawing of the basin uh, from during their regime. And something I noticed when I was a university student is that these old maps, while they look quite misshapen, are very accurate with regards to latitude, but with regards to longitude, they're terrible. And that's because they're me the means to carry time from a central zero point and measure how far east and west an object was on the face of the earth did not exist yet back in those days. Uh, it did exist in Bayfield's time. They will talk in a few minutes about how, how he coped with that. The charts that we're used to today didn't happen by accident. They were the results of an enormous amount of, la of labor. And uh, that began with Henry Bayfield in the, in the survey of the, of the Great Lakes. After the war, uh, most of the military drawings of the, of the lakes existed as officers' notes in report books. Uh, and incidentally, the form of those books is pretty much the same as what we use today. Uh, they're, they're basically notes uh, like what you'd call a triptych. And can anyone guess what this one is the triptych of? Do you remember what a triptych is? It's what you used to send away to CAA for if you're going on a trip. It was page after page of, of instructions. Carry on down the 401 until you get to Kingston, 
go past Kingston to the second exit, go north and so forth. That's how maps existed. And that's how the First Nations people described directions. This is actually a map of Lake Simcoe in Georgian Bay. If you turn it sideways, you'll see the shape of Lake Simcoe. And I think you can see my cursor here. There's Cook Bay. There's Kempenfelt Bay. There's the big portage past what is now a uh, 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 Barry and uh, uh, going to the Nottawasauga River. There's Lake Kuchiching and so on. The, the Trent Canal system, of course, hadn't been built yet. And Georgian Bay is, uh, is up here where the writing is. Well, that's not very good for navigation, although someone reading the script and following the directions could probably walk that trail. So the Royal Navy uh, established a base at the end of the War of 1812 at Penetanguishing. The site had been surveyed by Sir John Grave Simcoe when he made a canoe expedition around Upper Canada in the 1790s. And he marked the Bay at Penetang as a future naval base for a number of reasons. One being that it had a, a deep harbor. The other being that the entrance to the harbor was uh, uh, guarded by two overlapping shallow points so that if you didn't know there was a bay inside, you'd never know there was a harbor there. So the place was easy to hide. The Royal Navy came in force after the war. Uh, this is a painting done by one, rather a, a black and white image of a watercolor done by one of the officers from the far shore. I've amused myself by finding the exact spot where she, where she sat when she worked. Uh, this uh, drawing shows uh, Captain Roberts' fenced compound where he lived with his wife and sister-in-law. Over here, if you can see my, can you see my cursor moving, folks? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, this is the red storage building that is now the King's Wharf Theatre. This vessel up here dragged up on the ways is actually HMSB, uh, getting some repair work done to her. This vessel here is HMS Surprise, who was taken from the U.S. Navy during the, during the war. And this vessel and this vessel off to the side is actually Henry Bayfield's two open, 38-foot open gigs departing in the spring for a season's work on the Upper Great Lakes making charts. What a remarkable picture to have. This is a, a, one of our Atlantic Challenge gigs we built actually at the site back in the early 1990s. Uh, we have two up here now, and uh, it's a complete coincidence that they're almost exactly identical to the boats that Bayfield used when he charted the Upper Great Lakes. Uh, he would hire a crew of French Canadian boatmen from Penetanguishing all of whose families are still here. You can trace the names back. Uh, and in one boat was himself as a young lieutenant. In the other boat was a midshipman, a fellow named Philip Collins, who was completely inexperienced, but a quick learner. And the two of them together worked to chart all of Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, and Lake Superior using those two boats. They used to leave the site as soon as the ice was out in the spring, and they came back breaking ice when the season ended and spend winters in a little cabin that's been reconstructed at the site, uh, transferring their notes into sketches, which they then turned into charts when they went back to England after 1822. An interesting anecdote is that uh, uh, they were visited by some pretty famous people during their years working here. Uh, one of them was, was uh, later Sir John Franklin, who was lost in the Arctic in a very famous disastrous expedition. But he passed through Penetanguishing one season on his way north going overland to chart the Upper Great Lakes. And an interesting historical note is that a book has been published now uh, that has gone back to first, uh, first evidences. And uh, contrary to what people have believed for the past 150 years, Franklin was not trying to find the Northwest Passage with only a very short uh, uh, blank space. It had already been charted by overland expeditions. They knew it was useless for commerce. The, there was just too much ice then. But what they were trying to do was get to the magnetic North Pole, which they knew wandered and they knew was in the Northwest Arctic, north of what is now Yukon, and make scientific observations there because it was surmised that if a pattern could be discerned to the movement and wandering of magnetic North, a, de a mechanical device might be made that a ship could carry that would compare variation where the ship was with predicted variation at the magnetic North Pole, in effect creating a mechanical GPS. 
And if the Royal Navy had that, that would have been a world dominating innovation. We know now today that the idea was impossible, but they had to try it. So that's what Franklin was trying to do in those expeditions going up into the Arctic. That's why they tried so hard. And another uh, interesting side note is in one of Bayfield's journals, which have been published by the Champlain Society, he comments that during those long winter nights, he and Collins would play chess in their tiny cabin after work. And, and the stakes of the tournaments they had would be who got, who got to go out with Captain Robert's sister-in-law. We know now her name was Letitia. I've, uh, no, no painting of her has ever been found, but Bayfield described her as an English rose blooming in the wilderness. No doubt she was a pretty young woman. That's another picture of uh, the two, our two gigs. This is actually in Ireland, but I imagine that's pretty much what Franklin's, or sorry, what Bayfield's boats looked like when he was leaving on a survey expedition heading up the coast. Same rig, same size, same number of people on them. And this is a painting by Franz Johnson, one of the group of seven. It's of a, uh, uh, of a survey expedition, but from the 1930s. And that yes, that's a canoe, not a, not a gig. But I imagine that's pretty much what Franklin's, or what, uh, I did it again, what Bayfield's men looked like when they're heading up the coast at the beginning of a trip. Absolutely overloaded with gear and beginning uh, weeks and weeks and weeks of wandering up the coast, surveying and making charts. I found this in the uh, National Archives. It's on the back of a chart, and it's it's cartoons drawn by a uh, a, a surveyor of of uh, of of Bayfield's vintage. It shows uh, basically the work being done, and what you can't see on one that it was just too faint to photograph was swatting mosquitoes. And I'll describe in a few minutes what those people are actually doing. And this you may know is HMSB. Uh, I'm actually in that picture. Uh, uh, I've got my my uh, my officer's coat off. That's me right there. I remember that day we had a, a load of uh, tourists we were taking out in Lower Penetanguishene Bay, and there was a motorboat dodging around under our lee. And I was just about to bend over to look under the foot of the foresail to see who the hell that was, get uh, because I wanted to bear away. Uh, and it turned out it was my friend Roland Kersdorfer taking my favorite photograph of that lo lovely little schooner. She hasn't sailed a program since 2002 when she was basically laid up and made a stationary exhibit. But I'm very pleased to say that uh, the Ontario government has devoted considerable resources to putting both she and her larger sister Tecumseh through a massive comprehensive refit that's proceeding right now even as I speak. Uh, B is inside a heated building in Penetang at uh, the marina there, and she's basically being rebuilt. Uh, and uh, I may add also that they've hired a, a thoroughly expert firm to oversee the work. Uh, that's myself and my son. <laughs> I told my wife that uh, looking after her during this refit is almost like being a grandfather. When the diapers are full, you hand it back. So I'm there <laughs> to uh, guide the work, but they're doing it. So, they, uh Bayfield charting the Upper Great Lakes in in four years. Imagine the the complexity of that task. So to to describe how they did that with only quite uh, mechanical instruments, I'll bring us all back to the horrors of uh, Grade Eleven geometry, which we all suffered through back in high school. Uh, the key to the whole shebang is using Pythagoras theorem for solving triangles, and this is an engraving from the early seventeen hundreds. But here's what's happening. Uh, they have drawn a sight line using this telescope on an object, which happens to be a tree across the bay. Well, how far away is that? They, these guys don't know. But what they can do is create a baseline to another point where they then take another sight line. And what they know now is that this angle here, A, is 90 degrees. And they've been able to measure this angle here by using their instrument to measure the, that, that sweep. So according to Pythagoras, if you know the length of one side and two angles, you can solve the length of the other two sides of the triangle. And once you've done that, you can just keep building triangles. And that's what Bayfield did for over 600 miles of coast up Georgian Bay. Isn't that just simple, but totally amazing? A chain 
is strangely enough is exactly 66 feet and until the advent of laser it's what surveyors still used why 66 feet it made sense to somebody in 1620 something when the system was was first perfected uh but it, it's a convenient length why chain because it doesn't stretch and uh if they used rope and it stretched even inches that would minutely change this angle and throw the whole thing off and they worked very hard to be very accurate so this is a sketch i made of the anchorage at penetanguishing which is what bayfield did when he first started his work this triangle here is where the slipway that they used to haul HMSB ashore was, and Bayfield set a post there. This is Magazine Island across the anchorage. So what he did was set a post there, stretch his chain, set a post here, and now he's got a 90 degree angle here. So he measures, sorry, he's got 66 feet here. He knows that angle is 90 degrees. He knows this angle because he's he's measured the sweep using a sextant or a theodolite, and he knows what the angle of those two lines are converging, and that lets him solve the legs of the of the, the sides of the triangle to see how far away that is in meters, or he would have used yards. And once you have one triangle, you just keep building triangles and working your way around, and he's able to precisely locate the, the corners of the wharf the length of the island and how far away everything is from everything else. And that's in a small scale, but what the Royal Navy's hydro hydrographers were doing in those years all over the world was this, building triangles. This is an actual sketch from a, a naval survey by a fellow named Mac. And what he's done is taken a mountain peak, which is up at the top of the screen, and used it to build triangles around and around and around to ascertain the positions of this bay. He didn't have to go to the mountain peak, he just had to see it. And once he started building his triangles, he could work his way around the bay and, and very precisely organize the, the positions of everything. Afterwards, after a season of working, he would sit down and take the notes and draw and, and draw them in, filling in the coastline from his paintings he'd make while he was going. This one's not in great focus. Uh, and then fortunately, that's how it looks on the microfilm and the archive. But you can see exactly here a Royal Navy surveyor building triangles, working his way up a coast. And that's that's how he created that chart. Building triangles, solving the sides, moving on to the next one. And this is me. When we first moved here to Georgian Bay, I was sailing my wooden folk boat up, uh, up uh, near uh, the Bustard Islands. And we came into an anchorage. And what did we find but a survey marker? And on the side of that chunk of white cedar, is carved QC 1820. And I thought, my God, is it possible that one of Bayfield's 1820 survey markers survived? I was very excited. So I squatted beside the uh, marker uh, for sale and uh, we took a picture of it and carried it home to us to start doing research. It turned out it wasn't Bayfield's. It was a marker left in the 1880s by Captain Bolton, who the Royal Navy sent that, that year to confirm Bayfield's work. And Bolton reported that after two years of surveying, 60 years later, he didn't find any errors. And he was absolutely in awe of the, of the uh, completeness of Bayfield's work. And I'll add too, that after, when I was squatting beside, that, for that, beside the post for that picture, uh, this was my view looking the other direction. And you probably can't see it in this picture, but in that dark spot right there was an enormous black bear with a white chevron on his chest. And I stood up and pointed over my friend's shoulder and said, a bear. And not one, but two bears came out of the bush, a mother and a cub. And I learned a chilling fact then that day, the mother and the cub followed us down the channel as we sailed away. They didn't mind swimming between islands and they seemed to be just as fast in the water as loping along over the rocks. The uh, cub was very curious about us, and the mother was following us, following the cub, and uh, we made sure we didn't touch uh, touch land until we were quite a few miles down the coast from that. <laughs> so um, this uh, hodgepodge here is uh, a mass of surveyor's instruments. I'm just going to go over a minute and describe what Bayfield actually used himself. Uh, the whole thing is about measuring angles to develop, to create those triangles so you could use Pythagoras to solve them. 
Uh, the most primitive and probably one of the most accurate of those was actually an ancient Arabic instrument called an astrolabe. These work extremely well by hanging them on a string from the top ring and then uh, moving this cursor until you line up the object in the sky with uh, the horizon and you can measure how high something is. Or if you turn it sideways and lock its position, you can measure angles between looking at, say, two ends of an island. Uh, they don't work so well horizontally. And of course, in boats, they don't work very well vertically because if you hang them by a string to orient them to, to the earth, they swing. So uh, they were superseded quite early. And that's actually an example of how to use the astrolabe. They were superseded by what, what's called a, a backstaff. These work really well. Uh, it's Imagine a ruler with uh, various cursors on the ruler and you slide the cursor back and forth until your line of sight, say the sun and the horizon, are in the right position with your cheekbone touching the end of the of the stick and turn it sideways and it'll do the same for islands. But you need a lot of cursors and of course they don't work so well for the sun because one can uh, one gets dazzled. So in the early 1700s, uh, octants began appearing and this is a rather complex device I'll go into a bit more uh, detail that measures angles with the use of mirrors and shades so that one isn't dazzled and they're a bit more uh, um, uh, flexible with regards to measuring things terrestrially when they're turned sideways. So basically, uh, an octant or later a sextant is a degree scale. In this case, it's zero to 90. Most of them today go to 120 or higher. A, a, a mirror, which is gl glazed on one side, clear, and has a reflective surface on the other. So there's two images you see. And a second mirror, that's up at the top here that moves on an arm. So what one does is move this arm back to zero. And at that point, both the mirrored image that's gone through the zigzag reflection is lined up with the clear side. And then you roll the instrument up or conversely come down with it until you've got the object in the sky or horizontally the end of the island lined up with the other thing you want to measure. I'll show you more about that. It's, they can be very accurate, and you read the you read the uh, the angle off the scale on the bottom. So this picture shows what the image looks like when you're looking through it, and what this young man is doing is he's brought the sun down to the horizon, and the scale at the bottom that he's twiddled with his other hand will show the number of degrees that he had to move that upper mirror to bring it down. Do do you follow that? Yes. Bayfield did that in his boats, holding the sextant sideways. And uh, that, that works quite well. And uh, it's, it's very accurate. And it's what people do today. And in another talk I do about my early wandering days sailing, I describe finding Bermuda coming north from St. Martin using a, a, a $60 plastic uh, sextant. No one was more surprised than I when I saw that lighthouse on St. David's Head blink. And I realized we weren't going to Greenland after all. <laughs> this is a sextant as uh, as Bayfield would have used it. You can see the the frame is no longer wooden. That was that's very important because the structure of it needs to be uh, as proof as possible from warping or expanding and contracting with temperature and humidity changes. the The shape of the framework is designed to inhibit uh, flexibility. The telescope is designed to make the image he sees uh, finer. There's the mirrors that would shade the sun. There's the split mirror uh, that uh, lets them see the two images. And down here is a, is a vernier scale with a magnifying glass built into it so that he can see very minute adjustments. Uh, Bayfield carried two of those on his expedition. And I wish they could say that they were both still in a museum somewhere, but they've been lost to time. He also carried what's called a theodolite, which essentially is what surveyors still use today. And a theodolite is a, basically a sextant, but the uh, scale of the arc is 360 degrees. So it's, it's much more flexible. And it also has a horizontal scale. So you don't have to turn the instrument around. You can uh, aim the telescope at one end of an island, record the number after, after orienting the, uh, the lower scale with, with, your, with your hand compass, and then swivel the whole thing to look at a mountain peak or another 
uh, at the other end of an island or some other feature and record that figure and then very precisely calculate the angle. Uh, this doesn't work afloat because, of course, it needs to be still and on a stand. But uh, uh, Bayfield had one of these, and they carried that all over the Great Lakes, making their measurements and recording the angles to build their triangles. This is a picture from the 1930s, but it's two men using a theodolite. The reason that tripod behind them is so large as a marker is so it can be seen from a long distance, because I well imagine there's another team that could be up to five or six miles away, making the other corner of the triangle they're building, and it needs to be seen. And the caption that came with this picture described that those are not rain shawls they're wearing, those are gauze for mosquitoes. And Bayfield did describe that the mosquitoes on Georgian Bay were so thick in the spring when he was working that they had difficulty eating without bringing mouthfuls of the bugs in with the food. They, they <laughs> suffered a fair bit during that work. They used to uh, drag the boats up on the shore, use the sails to set up as tents, and then build smoky fires and hope that the smoky fires kept the mosquitoes away. And those of you who know Georgian Bay at all know that there's a place about 25 miles north of us here in Midland called Starvation Bay. And that is where the two Bayfields, two boats were waiting for HMSB to find them with supplies. She couldn't find them. Of course, there's no radio telephones or cell phones in those days. And all B could do was try to, was try to lo locate the boats based on where they thought they would be. And nobody had made charts yet. So they had to be very cautious wandering through the waters. Bayfield said that at Starvation Bay, as he named it, and it's still called that, they were eating seagulls by the time B found them. And he said seagulls were not good eating. This is a surveyor's chain, as Bayfield would have known it. As I said, it's exactly 66 feet long, and it's made of chain because chain doesn't stretch. And they've made it as light as possible because pulling that, dragging that chain out 66 feet over, over hill and dale, and then pulling it tight was described as the most miserable of the surveyor's work. And that's what this drawing is describing. It's, it's what, is, what is the definition of hell on earth? It is carrying the chain for the surveyor. And there's, there's a fellow building the base of his triangle. The fellow on the, on the right has the, has the uh, theodolite and he wants to make that a 90 degree angle. So he's telling the man with the pike to move back and forth till they get it right. Well, the lowest paid man is carrying the, uh, carrying the chain out. So uh, this is a, a, a piece of a facsimile of the very first nautical chart of Georgian Bay. And as I said earlier, uh, Bayfield's work was so meticulous that uh, Bolton found no errors in his work. He filled in some details, but he found no errors and uh, no substantial changes were made in the charts until the advent of aerial photography came along. Now imagine that, a man eaten alive by mosquitoes, starving sometimes, freezing, getting soaked in the rain, working in open boats, in only four years charting our, our coasts with such accuracy that nobody had to change his work for over 100 years. And something I find particularly moving about this image is this line of soundings here. It goes from the, from what, uh, the tip of Hope Island up to the Western Islands, and there's a slight curve to it. If you lay a ruler on that line of soundings that they made, you can see there's a curve. And I imagine what happened was there was a west wind blowing. And as the boat was traveling along, making its soundings every, every mile or so, they were drifting to leeward, which would, would have been east then. But Bayfield was so conscientious of the need to be accurate that he included the curve for leeway. And at the end of the trip, they've, they've turned west a bit to try to make their landfall. They would have been taking bearings back on their on their uh, uh, their point of origin, and to port and starboard on objects they knew to fix the point of each one of those soundings as they made their trip. And here, coming back, the line is much straighter. Perhaps they were sailing with a northwest wind, broad reaching. They wouldn't have made so much leeway. I find that's almost hair raising to see how uh, conscientious and ethical uh, Bayfield was in the work that he was doing. That he included the curve for leeway in that line of soundings. So he called our coast the 30,000 islands. He did it partly because there's a lot of islands here. It's actually more than 30,000, but also because in each of the four years he was working on the coast, he was chided by, by Whitehall for hurrying up and finishing because they couldn't conceive why it took so long to do a few hundred miles of coast. 
Well, we know why, and uh, uh, Georgian Bay is probably one of the best cruising grounds in the world, but uh, that's the coast that he was trying to fix the positions of as many rocks and islands as possible in. Now, here's another one of Bayfield's charts. This is uh, Whitefish Bay at the beginning of Lake Superior. There's Whitefish Point, and Sault Ste. Marie is just, or uh, today, is just off to the right. Bayfield noted wreck of the schooner Invincible on, the, on that point. Invincible was a Royal Naval schooner that was operating on the Upper Great Lakes before the War of 1812. She was lost on the beach, and he saw her wreck, so he, he marked its location. I sit on the board of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society, and our offices and historical campus is on Whitefish Point. We've walked up and down that beach looking for that wreck. We've driven poles into the sand. We can't find her. And I can't believe that if Bayfield was so accurate and conscientious about everything else he did, he was wrong about the location of that wreck. And what I'm thinking is that that very sandy point that's now quite treed, I think it may have moved, as happens with big dune structures sometimes due to the west wind and the terrific storms up there. The wreck probably looked something like this when Bayfield saw it. I guess Invincible wasn't really so invincible. Uh, but she's been buried and she's under the sand there somewhere. And although we found many other significant wrecks, one of them being the Edmund Fitzgerald, we've uh, we've never found Invincible, and I hope someday we do, and I hope I'm part of that team when we do it. So that's my talk about Bayfield. Uh, I think he deserves more uh, attention for the great work he did and the, uh, the very thoroughness of, of his chart making. And we who sail on the Great Lakes owe a lot to him. He went back to England uh, in about 1825 and spent years turning his surveys into charts that were then published. In 1867, the year of Confederation, the Royal Navy, uh, the Admiralty, the Royal Navy's Admiralty published over 200 charts of Canada, locations in Canada. That's the coasts of uh, the Maritimes up to St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes. Bayfield surveyed and drew more than half of them. When he retired uh, after uh, Confederation, he came back to Canada and uh, he lived uh, the rest of his life and died in Charlottetown. And uh, strangely enough, I was just there and I was so caught up with work last Friday when I was in Charlottetown, I forgot to look for his grave. So I'm gonna have to go back and, and find that spot so I can see it and I'll stand beside him. And if I'm wearing a hat, I'll salute and say, thanks mate. So thank you very much and I'll throw it open for questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, I have one question while I show every, uh, is there any connection between the name Bayfield Yachts and this Bayfield, or is that just a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence at all. And thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Bay, uh, Bayfield, Ontario was named for, for, for uh, Henry Bayfield. Uh, Bayfield Inlet on Georgian Bay is named for Bayfield. Bayfield Street in Barrie is named for Bayfield. And there's some Bayfields on Lake Michigan as well. Uh, he didn't name things for himself. People did it for him to honor him. There's also a Philip Edward Island in the northern part of Georgian Bay, just east of Killarney. That's named for Philip Edward Collins, who was uh, Bayfield's assistant. I should add that Bayfield was graced with a very long life. He passed away when he was 90, uh, but Collins did not. Uh, he was promoted to lieutenant, uh, but died of a fever while he was in a boat doing survey work in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. He worked basically to death. Well, uh, over here, reaction. No questions? Uh, mm -hmm. If you could please raise your... Oh, we have a question from uh, Linda Carter. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, this, this was fascinating. Uh, we were in Bayfield Sound off uh, the North Channel uh, last summer. But could you expand on, on how they named things? I mean, I know Bayfield Sound was named after him, but he was, he was, you know, 30,000 islands and umpteen other things. Uh, how did he go about naming them? And did he have to do it by himself or was the Admiralty involved? Uh, good question. Um, he, uh, in many cases, chose the names, but his choices needed to be ratified by the Admiralty. And uh, uh, he did it sometimes to honor people he knew, like Owen Sound is named for Commodore Owen, who's the captain Bayfield served under in the last year of the War of 1812. Uh, Perry is named for Captain Perry, uh, who was also an officer from those days. 
Uh, Franklin Island on Georgian Bay north of Paris Sound is named for Sir John Franklin. Uh, but other places uh, that were named for him uh, were names that were added by people that worked for him or above him. Uh, he was a relatively modest man. Uh, he didn't do he didn't name things for himself, but uh, he was honored that way. Clapperton Island up in the North Channel is named for Captain Clapperton, who was a very significant figure in the War of 1812. Wingfield Basin at the top of the uh, Bruce Peninsula is named for a lieutenant that uh, Bayfield knew, who was captured on Lake Ontario, wrote a tremendous, uh, well, rather wrote a diary of his time as a prisoner of war that has been uh, reprinted and published, and you can look it up. The, uh, the diary of Lieutenant Wingfield. Uh, so they, um, in answer to your question, he named some things himself, <laughs> did it, sometimes to honor people. Uh, sometimes uh, the Admiralty changed those names and in a few cases did it to honor him. I should add that he named his two boats, the Trotton and the Ramsden, and he did it because uh, those are the names of the people that made his sextant and his chronometer. And he hoped, uh, he wrote in his diary that by, my, by massaging them, they might give him better, newer, better working instruments. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next up is Noel, go ahead. Hello, Noel. Make sure you unmute yourself. Yes, I had to find a damn button even with my glasses on. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I've sailed a bunch up on Georgian Bay too. And what was interesting um, before GPS using all the charts and the black and white ones that were his charts with very, very little, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, modifications to them or, or additions. Yeah, yeah the, um, the charts have gotten better in detail, but not they haven't changed much. And many of them still say, based on surveys by Lieutenant Henry Bayfield or even Bolton, they sometimes have Bolton's name on them too. Yeah, I've seen that. In, in, and you know, even, I, 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 I got attacked online by somebody who was complaining that Canadian charts haven't changed since 1885 when Bolton made his survey. And I tried to explain yeah. to him that that was when the initial survey was done, but they're updated every few years and sometimes more often. He wouldn't believe it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Julia has her hand up. Go ahead, Julia. Unmute yourself. Thanks. Um, did I hear that this was part of the Treaty of Ghent? Uh, well, the end of the war was the Treaty of Ghent. Uh, and uh, that's an important uh, 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 document for Canada because despite the fact that the Royal Newfoundland Regiment and various First Nations formations had ranged far south of what is now the border between Canada and the US by the end of the war, the negotiators in Ghent, Belgium, didn't know that. And they uh, agreed with the Americans to put the border back where it was before the fighting. So if the information flow had been better when the Treaty of Ghent was being drafted, uh, what is now Michigan and parts of Ohio would have been a sovereign Indian nation, as they would have called them Indians then, but we say First Nations today. But two okay. things uh, scuppered that, one being uh, the negotiators in Belgium didn't know yet that the tide had turned our way. And the other thing was the, the British colonial officials knew that the Americans would never leave such a nation alone. There would be another war. Right. And as I described at the beginning, they just finished a three generations long world war. Nobody wanted to fight anymore. And the United States of America took advantage of that. Going on, uh, just this week again, I was connected to the Peace Arch Park which of course the, the treaty was signed over there with one of the ladies with the tourism side of things. She pretty much has been working there for 27 years in the park itself. And the interesting thing that came out of that from the touristic side is that families from all over the world have been meeting there during COVID to meet their family in Canada have come across because it's the only piece of land where they could find where they could meet without having to go through customs. Isn't that interesting? And one, one more thing, are you part of the International Joint Commission? Uh, I am not, but I, when I was an officer in the Navy, I need to observe its rules. <laughs> right, okay. Because I've got the maps and things here in the house from the International Joint Commission. Oh, anyway, back to you, back to uh, you, Diane. 
another piece of the uh, uh, or an aspect of the Treaty of Ghent was uh, the world's first working arms limitation treaty, the Rush Baggett Agreement, and that limited uh, the armament and number of warships on the Great Lakes. And uh, uh, that's why actually we have uh, the historic naval site now in Penetanguishene, and the Americans have a similar one in Erie, Pennsylvania. We, the signatories agreed to limit the number and force of warships on the Great Lakes severely, but we didn't trust each other. So we had Penetanguishene, the Americans had Erie, and for 54 years, they were ready on a week's notice to go to war. When I worked there, I used to describe our site as the Cold War missile silo of its day. And I think it's probably a oh. testament to uh, to diplomacy that the seven warships that were based at our base uh, died of old age rather than in combat. I mean, part of the, the interest from my perspective is all these peace parks between the border of the US and Canada. And um, I think the International um, Peace Garden south of Winnipeg also is a piece of land that could be a, a meeting place. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering also, the International um, the internet, the, the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, but it's mostly water. But I don't know if there's a road that goes between them. Do you? Anyone? No, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Ron Jenkins is next up. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, oh, so um, aside from uh, his chart charts, do any of his artifacts exist? So um, I mean, his instruments and things like that. Um, and the second part to that question is, is there any sort of collection of his materials in some place, like a museum or something like that? Uh, none of his instruments survive that I'm aware of, but his, his, his notes and later his paintings uh, have been collected. And the names of the two places where they are predominantly collected has flown out of my head at this moment. I think Royal Military College is one of them, but I'm not sure. If you want to write to me afterwards, I'll tell you. All right. And um, you mentioned that he was unhappy with his chronometer. Yes. Um, the chronometer had been, I think, developed some time before. Was yes. it just that he was not prioritized in the issuance of, of good equipment that way? Or, or what was it? Because, I mean, you pointed out some of the earlier maps where where the the lat or the longitude was wrong right is any of that deficiency available or noticeable in his his work uh no he did a good job and uh it's especially remarkable because most of his work was done without a chronometer at all uh he uh his priority as a as a lieutenant which is a relatively humble rank in the service was low and he was working in a boat and while accurate chronometers existed uh, they didn't uh, cope well with being bounced around much, and ships often carried multiple chronometers in order to average out their errors. Yeah, and, I saw well, that. Yeah, so uh, Bayfield uh, uh, Bayfield's chronometer was non-functional. He didn't even bring it for a lot of his times. What he did do was use uh, lunar uh, observations of various planets and the moon to very carefully establish the the longitude of Penetanguishene before he left. And then worked as 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 best he could using astronomical calculations while he was working up and down the coast, uh, in order to minimize the error. Uh, but he, like I said, despite naming his boats after the instrument makers, he never got a good one. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up is Jib. Go ahead. Uh, the accuracy, of course, determines on the number of significant figures that Bayfield did his calculations with. From his notes, was there, do you have any recollection of how many significant figures they used in their uh, calculations of using the sines and cosines to measure uh, the angle? 
Yes, that's a, a very good question. Are, are you a mathematician? I see you're you. Uh, you Unfortunately, drawn. yes. <laughs> okay. um, well, you you may be able to uh, 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 guide me on this in the future, but I know that for measuring his ankle uh, angles, he used uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. So uh, he could get uh, down to, I guess, a one, 120th of a uh, degree. For the uh, 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 for the uh, calculus he was doing, I believe the tables had four uh, decimal point, uh, four digits after the decimal. But I better check that to make sure I'm not giving you a duff information. Thank you very much. Marvelous talk. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Please ra uh, raise your uh, uh, virtual Zoom ham and remain on mute until we call on you. Any more questions? Go to the bottom right under reactions and you will find your I see reaction. someone physically. Oh, okay. uh, Rob, Rob, Robert is the next person with his uh, okay. virtual, virtual Zoom hand up. Go ahead, Robert. And Gard, I'm still gobsmacked by the uh, your comments about Franklin expedition not looking for the Northwest Passage and looking for the magnetic pole. I mean, no, remind me or repeat again, what's that that's based on? Uh, a, a book that was published recently, and I'll, I'll send you a, uh, I'll send you a link to it, Rob. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the British author made a very convincing case, and uh, this has all happened in the last five or six years. Uh, he pointed out they, they knew very well where, uh, the shape of most of the islands from la overland expeditions. Uh, except for one short blank area, and uh, Admiralty instructions to uh, to Franklin were to find find and observe the uh, the magnetic North Pole for the reasons I've stated. Uh, the depth of secrecy over it were so immense that uh, most historians in the Victorian era, of course, would have had no idea, no access to it. It's a great story, isn't it? And I'll I'll send you the links. N nice to see you, by the way. Uh, next up is Bill. Mo uh, not before you do it, make sure you raise your virtual hand, not your thumbs up. So go ahead, Bill. Unmute yourself, but go ahead, Bill. I thought he just talked. Okay. I think Bill McNaughton just talked, didn't he? Bill? No. Well, let's go on to Ray. Uh, Ray, go ahead. Thank you, Gordon, for such a very interesting presentation. Hello, Ray. Towards Thank the you. end of it, you showed a wreck. Um, am I right in thinking that as of um, the general hunter that was exposed in a storm off Southampton not so long ago? It is not, uh, but I, I know that wreck, and I was going to use a picture of, of that wreck, but he decided to pick a nondescript one from another part of the world. But good, good for you. <laughs> uh, interesting thing is, uh, after that wreck was thoroughly excavated by archaeologists here in Ontario, uh, it was reburied to preserve it. And the yeah. marker, uh, one of those men told me, is 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 intentionally in the wrong place to di to divert uh, treasure hunters. Ah, oh, good. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Whatever. Okay, next up is Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, on my uh, cell phone, I Googled slide rule origin. And this is a bit of history also. The slide rule was invented by William Outred in the 1600s, but became widely used in the mid 1800s after a French artillery officer named Amadi Mannheim developed a version that became popular among the engineers. By the early 1900s, engineering students in the US were commonly taught to use slide rules. So I was wondering if Bayfield used the slide rule in his calculations, or he had to do everything by hand in he, arithmetic. Yeah. Yeah, I do not believe the Royal Navy used slide rules, although I guess they would have been aware of them. Uh, they used tables that were uh, laboriously created for them and otherwise by hand. The four place significant figures on them. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Incidentally, uh, in the course of doing one of my 
historical documentaries, I had the great uh, excitement to hold in my hand a slide reel that was used as a range finding device for artillerymen. It, imagine a rectangle of brass with a, uh, a, a triangle, long thin triangle cut out of the middle of it and a cursor that slid. And if you held it up on the side that said men and looked at a formation of enemy soldiers and slid the cursor along until the ramp on the triangle was the height of the men, you could read the range, assuming an average height of a man. If you flip it over on the other side, it had a different scale. And that was for cavalry, a man on a horse. And the ranges it gave were from, I think from 100 yards up to 800 yards. Wow. They wow. use that today in the forensics of, mm -hmm. from the of video cameras. Is that so? Well, funny thing. I have one here from my days as a naval officer in training, and it's probably similar. Oh. To that. Huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up is Liz. Go ahead and mute yourself. Yes. Um, I mean, this has been fascinating, but then I'm information. Oh. We've oh, just sorry. lost you, Liz. I did unmute myself. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah, good. Go ahead. Okay, now? Yeah. Yes. Um, when did recording depths start being putting put on charts? Uh, that started with the beginning of charts. Uh, so I would say that uh, coastal areas and harbor inches, entrances were being recorded with depths as early as Sir Francis Drake's time and perhaps earlier than that. Uh, it became scientifically uh, uh, a practice of hydrographers, certainly before, before Bayfield's time. And interestingly, uh, uh, do you folks remember, I guess being sailors, you've probably seen Master and Commander. Do you remember the scene when we're casting the lead in the film and I had the, uh, had the seaman hold the end up and when the bosun called out the depth, he answered sand and broken shell. Well, they were keeping records of the nature of the bottom. Uh, you probably already know the the lead, uh, the casting lead that he dropped uh, was hollow in the end, and it could be filled with tallow, which would pick up a sample of the bottom. Oh. And they, they kept careful track of what the bottom was like. So in that long series of soundings of Bayfields I showed you, uh, he would have marked rock, mud, clay, blue clay, or whatever. Yeah. So that someone else sounding in fog might say, hmm, I'm getting gray clay. What did he find? I must be in this area. Okay. Um, Interesting. Well, did, did Bayfield record depths as well? Yes. Yes, with great accuracy. And actually, we've used those in charting the uh, water depth trends on the Great Lakes. And before we started our talk, I commented that the extreme low water we had here a few years ago was bang on a 63-year cycle that has been identified. Oh, my heavens. Bayfield. Yeah, I remember the floods at uh, Toronto Island 2017 and 2019. Yeah, the, the lower lakes are more affected by the canal work than the upper lakes. Uh, but yes, that was pretty bad. I remember Queen City was pretty soggy. Yeah. But you know, the water level at Toronto Island Marina right now is so low that the channel that goes from the harbor, I guess it's called Long Pond, the beach on either side, you could drive a car along it. Well. Wow. So it's, I've never seen it so low. So I don't know what that portends in the future spring. Okay. Well, there's big dams on the St. Lawrence and I guess that's what uh, affects that. And snowfall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, Jim has another question. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, considering the, the evolution of technology, does the uh, Canada sail and power and sail uh, squadron still teach uh, navigation using a sextant, or is that totally gone? <laughs> well, they, they, they still do teach it. Um, it's it's not part of the core because most people don't do it. But um, I'm one of those who believe that understanding the principles of, of traditional navigation is immensely important. Uh, and I'm actually uh, reminded of something my late father-in-law commented to me once. He was an engineer. And uh, I used to see a slide roll on his, on his desk at his house out in Victoria. Uh, but he commented that if you're used to using electronic technology to do all your calculations and observations, 
and you don't know the traditional means that were used to design those systems, how do you know if there's something wrong? That's right. And uh, that was something he used to pound the table about. And what I, what I tell people uh, about GPS and yachts and ships is uh, uh, someday that screen will just be black. And what, what do you do then? And how do you know if you're getting duff information if you don't know why the instrument is giving that? And I have to tell an anecdote. Uh, when I joined the Navy at the advanced age of 50, I was aboard one of our coastal defense vessels for the first time being showed around on the bridge. I was, uh, uh, you know, 50 years old, uh, but only an acting sub-lieutenant. Uh, and the, uh, the CO uh, uh, showed me uh, how they navigated. The, everything is electronic. They have charts, but they keep them locked in the drawer. They use a GPS set that's interfaced with their radar unit, and that's what they navigate by. And of course, they have a second one in a Faraday cage down below in the operations room, but they navigate by this electronic instrument, and there's no chart on the bridge. And I looked at that, and I said to the CO, you mean you trust your lives to that, sir? And then they all looked at me like I was a fool, and then I laughed and said, you know, I'll bet a thousand years ago someone looked at a compass and said, you trust your life to that? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, latitude, longitude, um, and uh, the time um, intervals were invented by Sanford from the University of Toronto, who needed to correlate train arrival and departure times, and that was the invention of uh, the fifteen. Uh, wide uh, time zones. That's correct. That's Canadian. That's right. Okay. Are, yeah. are, are there Hello. any more? Are Can there I, any more questions? Yeah. Please raise your virtual yeah. hand. Yeah. Sherry hasn't figured that out yet. Go ahead, Sherry. When can you hear me? Yes. Okay. When did it? What? When in history were the comp? Not just the compass, but the latitudes and longitudes. We're done. What country did it? And it, what, what, when was it done? That's that our our and longitude and latitude are coordinates. And yeah, I think we've all got radio licenses and we all know, you know, the, yeah. the I've done coastal navigation. And uh, when was that done? Well, the uh, codification of it as degrees happened uh, probably in the time of Drake. So late, late in uh, Queen Elizabeth's reign. Uh, the Vikings understood latitude. They had devices that could crudely measure the height of the sun and at noon roughly measure the, uh, uh, the uh, position of a vessel uh, with regards to north and south. They had nothing but estimation of speed and time that could uh, uh, do longitude. So uh, it was coming a long time and people, uh, it was something people knew they needed to understand for centuries before it actually started becoming as accurate and scientific as it is now. So yeah. certainly by the times of Cook and the uh, 1760s, it was a science. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, a any more questions before I turn it back to Diane? Okay, well, thank you so much, Board. Oh, Jim, uh, just, a bit, uh, just a bit, uh, Jim got his hand up before mm -hmm. you go ahead yep, jim in the canadian salem power squadron uh in learning about latitude and longitude the diameter of the earth was calculated uh in the from the egyptians by when um the curator of the uh library in alexandria um noted that when the sun was directly overhead, uh, you could then calculate the angle of the sun down a well, and he measured right. from Pythagoras uh, using simple uh, trigonometry, uh, the diameter of the earth. Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, triangles are powerful things in, in mathematics in the universe. And I'll, I'll add to that, that in uh, celestial navigation today, which uh, you know I, I used myself when we used to go to sea before the days of GPS, and I, I used my sextant horizontally today just for fun. Uh, celestial navigation works if you assume that the Earth is stationary, 
the heavenly bodies around it are all equidistant a very long way away and they're the ones that move not us and if you make that wrong assumption all the formulas work and i find that very amusing <laughs> okay okay now i'll turn it back to diane okay um i do have a couple of comments uh one i wonder if you would send me the link to that book as well and yes. i will um i will send it out to everybody so anybody who's interested they can follow up and take a look at it i think it would be fascinating to read and secondly I loved the explanation about the triangles. I never understood that before. I taught high school mathematics, but never understood the, the practical use of the geometry. And I wish I had known it because it would have made it so much better for my students, even well, though they could do the mechanics of it, but to understand why we use it. So thank you for that little gift at my, in my 80th year or my 81st year now? <laughs> I have a confession to make, Diane. What's I was that? a terrible student in mathematics. I guess I was quite willful until I realized that geometry was navigation. And I paid attention to that. And that's the only kind of math I ever got good marks in. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here today. And um, just a reminder about Moose Milk, we are moving.